enriched with nutrient cells. This upper layer of the epidermis that I have just described contains only carbohydrates, fat and protein in small concentrations and in a balanced mixture. It is optimally suited for the digestive system of the still unstable young fish. In addition, the trophically functioning epidermis, the epidermis able to provide nourishment, contains immunologically effective components. This means that it strengthens the immune system of the young fish. And finally, I would like to point out that bacteria and algae can be found in the intestines of the larvae that were previously located on the epidermis of the parent fish and are ingested while grazing the epidermis. Therefore, the basis for exogenous feeding for the larvae is provided. This immediately follows the phase of being fed via the parent fish. To sum it up, I'll say once again that the discus parents provide their larvae with an intragenous substance containing carbohydrates, fat and protein in small concentrations. And secondly, this substance supports the immune system of the young fish. And thirdly, through the grazing of epibiontic bacteria and algae, the basis for exogenous feeding is established. Another important step in the process of reproduction has been mastered with the first food made available by the parents. There are often difficulties with finding the food. This means the larvae do not swim to the parent fish and starve in some corner of the aquarium. Exactly what triggers the swimming to the parents is still not fully clear, but the dark color of the parent fish appears to be important. It's apparently an important requirement for recognizing the parents. Often the larvae will mistakenly swim to dark colored aquarium utensils, such as filter cartridges or the black glued edges of the aquarium. But once the first contact is made with the parent fish, for example, when the stray larvae are collected in the parent's mouth, the little ones usually remain at the side of the parents. According to popular opinion, the offspring apparently do not accept any other food in the first few days. Although paramecium and other microorganisms are the right size to be food for the swimming larvae. On the other hand, the freshly hatched noplia of the Artemia salina are probably still too large to be food for them. Sometimes in well-run-in aquariums with natural light, as early as the second day, the swimming larvae can be observed grazing on the algae-covered spawning substratum. It appears that microorganisms are the actual food. Starting a supplementary feeding with small freshly hatched noplia obviously has a very positive effect on their growth. But even when they're exclusively fed by way of the parent fish, the growth of the larvae can be observed. Above all, optimal water quality is important. Smaller amounts of fresh water can usually be added now without difficulty. When should supplementary feeding be started and how long must the young fish remain with their parents?
On the fourth day after the larvae swim free, we feed them freshly hatched noblia of Artemia salina as a first supplement to the secretion available from the parent fish. Unlike some of the other discus breeders, I don't think the young fish should be separated from their parents prematurely, so that possible parasites are not contracted by the young ones. I have noticed that because the secretion is available day and night to the young fish as food, the growth of these young fish is much more constant than when they are separated from their parents after six or eight days. On the eighth day, we begin giving the young fish bosmina or other tiny water fleas as a supplementary food. This is expanded to include a food paste comprised of beef heart, beef liver, raw fish and vitamins 12 to 14 days after the larvae swim free. At the same time, we match the water values, mind you, the breeding water values, to the values of the tap water, which in my area lies between 7 and 7.5, which is considered neutral to slightly alkaline. The conductivity of the water is approximately 300 microsiemens. With plenty of food and good water quality, the young fish grow very quickly. Within a short time, their total length will double. When possible, they should be fed five to six times a day at appropriate intervals. It's important to thoroughly remove waste and food residues and to refill the tank with the appropriate amount of fresh water. Very soon, the appearance of the young fish changes. The form of their bodies changes. Often as early as the 12th day, they look like typical high-bodied mini discus fish. In this period, they begin to gather their food from the bottom of the tank as well. With this step, they gain a certain degree of independence. Even though the young fish will still swim to the parents when they're hungry or for protection, this bond becomes less strong every day. When the young fish are 15 to 18 days old, they can be separated from the parents. By this time, caring for them is no longer a problem. In the meantime, they've nearly developed into omnivores. It's only important the food pieces are not too large because discus fish have small mouths and are sometimes somewhat clumsy when it comes to eating. At this time, they should still be fed at least five to six times a day. It's also important that they receive a varied diet. Live food should be cut into appropriately small pieces when necessary. Frozen food should only be fed after being defrosted and thoroughly rinsed. Food residues and feces should be removed from the tank before each feeding. After this, a partial water change should be made when possible at least five to 10% of the tank water volume. The supplementary filter promotes the stability of the fresh water and helps to quickly reduce developing pollutants. Mistakes and acts of neglect during the first few days and weeks can seldom be made up for later. Bad water quality as well as an unbalanced diet and parsimonious feeding will soon show its effects. For example, the unattractive longish body forms are not only the degenerational effects of inbreeding, but also can be attributed to an unbalanced diet and bad water. Healthy discus fish that have been optimally raised can reach a total length of five to six centimeters at the age of two months. Although not all species and breeding varieties grow at an identical rate, this size can still be used as an average value. Breeding the discus is often a challenge. For optimal breeding of the discus, it's important to remember water care and a healthy, diversified diet. And it cannot be said too often, successful, healthy reproduction will only succeed in optimal water. An aquarium is only a mini biotope when compared to nature. Constantly developing wastes, such as food residues, feces, and urine, must be reduced with a tentative care. 
This task is performed by microorganisms and certain useful bacteria, which quickly convert the toxic byproduct nitrite into the comparatively harmless nitrate through the so-called nitrification process. These bacteria are present in every aquarium. They colonize every surface. The more surface available, for example, in a large filter, the more nitrifying bacteria at your disposal as important helpers in the fight to reduce waste. For this process, the oxygen content of the water is also important. The more oxygen there is, the faster and more effective the nitrification. With too little oxygen, the less harmful nitrate may possibly be transformed into the toxic nitrite. Too much nitrate can be growth retarding. The only alternative to removing existing nitrate is regular partial water changes. This means, depending on the water volume of the tank, approximately 5 to 10 percent of the water volume before each feeding. At the same time, it's necessary to remove the feces and food residues and other waste products. With this form of water care, water low in microbes is created at the same time. This is an important requirement for successful breeding. Discus fish have special needs. Their constitution and their biological makeup make them something special in nature as well as in the aquarium. They still are and will remain a challenge for every fish keeper and breeder. The epidermis, that is the upper skin of the teleostein, is equipped with an entire collection of defense mechanisms of a structural and biochemical nature against a diversity of environmental noxa, such as parasites, say probiotic bacteria. This means decay level bacteria and toxic water contents. Before the functional change to the care for the offspring can take place in the epidermis, its protecting function must be discarded and the habitat must allow for the step. Due to their nature, blackwater regions are areas low in bacteria because of the large amounts of humic acid. 101 to 103 bacteria is generally the amount that is present there. I have found aquariums with a germ count of 108 per milliliter.